we're going to talk about some common springtime problems that you will have in your home garden. What we've done is we've compiled 10 of the questions that the master gardeners get the most. So these are the most frequently asked questions that we get in the springtime. So there's going to be something within these 10 in problems that I'm going to talk about that I'm sure some of you are going to have. What we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about this description of the problem, what it looks like, what caused it, and hopefully give you some good solutions to take care of that problem. This will include some diseases, some insects, and environmental problem. Now I'm going to start off with something that all of us, I'm sure, are going to have some type of problem from because of our winter. Winter injury. I'm sure everyone here is going to have some type of winter injury on their plants. Some of you are going to have broken branches because of the snow load or because of the ice that you may have had. Some of you are going to have some of your evergreens like your rhododendrons or your pieris or some of those are probably going to have some burnt tips on their leaves because the air temperature was cold for such a long time. Some of your plants might not come back at all. We had a lot of cold temperatures that went into the soil pretty far. So some of your plants that are a little bit more tender are going to have some root damage and they might not come back at all. You may have some shrubs that have the stems are dead and you think, okay, that shrub's dead, it's, it's done, I'm gonna pull it out. Well, don't do that yet because sometimes it takes winter damage on plants, it takes some months or even years to finally show up. Sometimes plants can live longer on their reserves that they have and if you pull it out of the ground and it was one of your favorite plants, it might just have made it. So if you have a plant that you think is dead from the winter time this year, wait a little while before you actually dig that thing up. You might be surprised. If you do have dead branches and you obviously they're dead, definitely prune them out. Dead branches encourage diseases to come in. If you have a branch on a big tree or that has broken off and you have that jagged edges, definitely learn how to make the proper pruning cut. Jagged edges on trees and branches just encourage insects. It's a place for the insects to come in. It's a nice place for the diseases to come in. But a nice pruning cut will take care of that problem. Some of you may have even had frost cracked or freeze cracks. The water gets in the bark of a tree and then the water freezes. And as it freezes, it expands and you'll see a vertical crack down your tree. If that happens, most of the time the trees will survive. If the tree is so damaged into the cambium that it doesn't survive, you'll know that in a few years. You've all probably come across aphids in your lifetime, I'm sure. Uh, you know, we have aphids on your roses, you know what those are. You say, oh, okay, I got aphids on my roses again. But the one thing that people don't realize is on fruit trees. They see the tips of their fruit trees are, the leaves are curled on the new growth and when they go to look at it, if they can even reach it, it depends on how big their tree is, they go to look at this and they say, I don't see anything. Well, by the time the leaves curled, the aphids are already gone. The aphids were there sucking all of the fluids out of that leaf and it's distorting it. And that's what causes that, that's what causes the damage on most of your fruit trees when you see the very tips with the curled leaves. One thing you can do is don't overdo the nitrogen fertilizer. And nitrogen encourages new growth, new succulent growth, and that's what the aphids love. They love that succulent growth. So don't overdo the, the fertilizers, especially the nitrogen fertilizer. If you do have aphids on your plants, the ones that are not curled, you could just take a hard spray of water and spray those right off, like your, your vegetable plants or your new vegetable plants that you just put in the ground this spring, or your roses that are just now starting to come out. They may have some aphids on them. Spray them with a hard spray of water. Those will knock those aphids off. They're soft-bodied little creatures. When you knock them off, they're not gonna do a very good job of getting climbing back up onto that rose. So it does a pretty good job with just water. You wanna encourage their natural enemies. There are a lot of little tiny insects out there, a lot of parasitic wasps that are smaller than an aphid. They lay their eggs inside of the aphids and, and as the egg develop, it destroys the aphid. So you wanna encourage those in your yard. That means you wanna plant some flowering plants that, that will encourage these smaller insects to come into your yard. If you do need to use insecticidal soap as a last resort, 
Um, it is an organic material. But remember, anytime you spray for, a, for an insect, if there are already beneficial insects there, those beneficial insects are going to be killed also. So your yeah, best idea is maybe just spray them off with some water. Winter cutworms. It's not a worm, it's actually a caterpillar. And you can see the picture there, the caterpillar. It's also called the greater yellow underwing. If you have a plant, maybe your herbaceous plants are just starting to come up out of the ground, or you've just planted some seeds in your vegetable garden and they're coming up, and you notice there's chew marks on the leaves, or maybe there's chewing right down at the, at the soil level, that's probably done by a cutworm. And this cutworm, unfortunately, is very gregacious. Is that how you say that word? Gregarious. Gregarious, Gregarious. that's it. He eats a lot. <laughs> and they go in groups. So they can devastate your plants in a very short amount of time. The, like I said, you can see the picture of what the adult looks like. It's a moth. The caterpillar that does all the damage starts out small and goes through different life stages and grows larger, starts out greenish and then gets kind of brownish, and then as it matures, it'll get kind of gray or olive green. They're a smooth caterpillar. They're not a fluffy caterpillar with hairs on them. And the best way to do is just dispatch them any way you can. If you sausage. see them, <laughs> stomp on them, cut them in half, take some water, soapy water out there, dump them in. The BT is an organic uh, pesticide. It's called Bacillus thuringiensis. It does work on caterpillars, but it probably won't work very good in your home garden outside. If you're having trouble in a container, it may work in the container, but it only works when the caterpillars are young, only when they're about half size, which would be maybe three quarters of an inch. So your best bet is to go out there in the evening, because that's when they like to do the damage. Go out in the evening and look at your plants that you've seen chew marks on. See if you can see any of these caterpillars walking around. If you can, nice pair of gloves, pick them up and dispatch them the best you can. Those of you that grow vegetables will definitely, sometime in your vegetable growing lifetime, will come across either one of these beetles or both of these beetles. The flea beetle and the cucumber beetle. They are both leaf chewing beetles and you can tell the difference from their damage the flea beetle is tiny, only about the size of a head of a pin. And they're black with kind of a metallic bluish color to them. And when they start chewing on your leaves, they, they chew in the middle of the leaf and they'll make little BB sized holes. If your plants mature and it's healthy, it can stand a few of these insects, a few of these critters. But if you're just planting your transplants or your new seedlings are just coming up through the ground, they can do a little bit of damage on them. So you gotta be real careful and be out there looking for them when your new plants are coming out of the ground. The cucumber beetles are about the size of a ladybug, only they're a little different shape. They're more oval shaped than a ladybug is. There are striped cucumber beetles and spotted cucumber beetles. In our area, we seem to have more trouble with the spotted ones than we do with the striped ones. Crop rotation is so important if you've had trouble with either one of these beetles. The flea beetle overwinters as an adult in the ground, in the, in the debris of wherever they had their food from the last year, last summer. And the cucumber beetle lays her eggs under the soil, just in the same area where she found the food last year. So if you plant, if you have broccoli and you're having trouble with your broccoli and you put the broccoli in the same spot, you're gonna have trouble with those little critters again the next year. But you'll need to move them to another area of the garden. That way, when the insects come up and they emerge out of the soil, they won't have that food source right there. And they may have a little bit more trouble finding where you took your broccoli and where you put them. Floating row covers is that material that you can set over your plants. The water still goes down, but it allows, it keeps the insects out, the flying insects out. If you have not rotated your crops, that's not a good idea to use floating row cover because then you're just making a nice little home for all those cucumber beetles and flea beetles to come up and, and yummy on those plants that you've got there. Trap crops sometimes work. These bugs love, especially the flea beetles, they love radishes. And if you want them to stay away from your broccoli, then plant some radishes by your broccoli. Now, they will either eat all the radishes and stay away from your broccoli, or they'll tell their friends and family to come because we've got a really good feast for you here. 
but you might try it and see if it works. Once again, like I mentioned with the aphids, encourage those beneficial insects. Don't just plant vegetables in your garden, plant flowers too. That'll bring the good bugs in. Yellow, yellow sticky traps. The, both of these insects are attracted to the color yellow. You can purchase yellow sticky traps or you can make your own, take some cardboard, paint them yellow, put some sticky like Vaseline on them and these bugs will stick to them. They're very <coughs> difficult to control with chemicals, so you definitely need to try some other cultural, the things that we just mentioned. Okay, spotted wing drosophila. If any of you have soft fruits, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, cherries, you're probably going to at some time in their lifetime have trouble with the spotted wing drosophila. This is a fruit fly that doesn't wait for your fruit to rot before it starts eating, in the, eating on them. It, the female deposits her egg inside of the fruit as it's ripening on your vines. And what happens is you go, to, you go to pick your berries and you'll notice they're all squishy and soft. And if you open them up, you'll see either little white eggs or you'll see the little white larva, which is the maggot of the fruit fly. You can set out traps. OSU has some really good publications and there's some back there in the display about blueberries. There is a spotted wing drosophila trap back there and also a picture of the spotted wing drosophila and some little, little samples of some back there. And you can set these traps out in your garden. They're filled with apple cider vinegar, and the smell will attract the spotted wing drosophila to that, to that, to the trap instead of to your berries. The reason they call them a spotted wing drosophila is pretty obvious, isn't it? Because the males have these spots on top of their wings. I guess I should have put it back so you could see their wings. The male has a spot on the top of their wing. The female doesn't have the spot, but she has that very special ovipositor that's like a saw, so she can saw into those berries before they even get ripe, okay? Once again, just like I said before, definitely encourage the beneficial insects to come. They can take care of, uh, they can take, and the birds too. If you, if you have swallow nests, it's a good idea to put your swallow's nest up where your berries are because your swallows will eat a lot of the flying insects that fly around. Berries that are harvested early in the season won't have as much trouble. The berries that, that you have a later season, like your fall crop or your midsummer crop, you'll have a little bit more trouble with them. There are several generations of these flies all summer long. So it's, it's good to get your early berries, get them in, get them harvested as soon as you can. Sanitation is really important because we don't want them overwintering in all the leaf litter or things that are underneath your plants. So definitely sanitation. Sanitation is one of the things when we talk about diseases and pests that is very important. You'll hear master gardeners talk about that all the time when somebody has a problem. Sanitation, sanitation, because diseases and insects overwinter in things that you've left on the ground or dead things you've left on the tree. All right, now I'm gonna do for a couple of specifics. How many of you have dogwoods trees? A lot of you do, good, good, they're beautiful. Um, but they also have a problem, and they have a disease, a fungus called anthracnose. One thing about the anthracnose is very easy to identify. The leaves usually start with a raggedy edge brown spot on the very tip, and as it mature, it will go down the mid vein of the, of the leaf. The stems of a dogwood, if it has anthracnose, the stems you'll notice will have little sunken areas with these brown spots, and then there'll be a little purple halo around the spot, and then that part of the plant will die, that part of the stem will die there. The flowers will also end up with a little bit of the damage on them. You can plant resistant cultivars and varieties. There's a few in your handout that you have listed, a couple of them. If you call the Master Gardeners, we can give you a list of more different types of dogwoods, cornice dogwoods that are not susceptible to anthracnose. You want to have definitely, if you haven't planted one yet and you're thinking about it, try to avoid our native Pacific dogwood. Unfortunately, it is one of the worst for getting this anthracnose fungus. Prune out the infected pieces, infected limbs whenever you can see them, and make sure that you clean your pruners in between times. We don't want to spread it to other parts of your plant. Rake up, there's that sanitation. Rake up any fallen leaves you have. If you have a dogwood tree and you've noticed that it held onto its leaves all winter long and didn't lose its leaves like it's supposed to, that's anthracnose. So you'll know that it's time to start thinking about in spring what you're gonna do about to take care of that problem. And of course, don't let the canopy get wet. <laughs> we live in Oregon 
And it's, it's a springtime disease. There's really not lots you can do about it unless you have a little big umbrella to put over that tree. All right, how many of you grow lilacs? All right, how many of you have lilacs from your mom or your grandma? All right, some of us do, yeah. There is a bacteria called a bacterial blight. It's a bacteria that gets on lilacs and a few other plants too. You'll notice the new growth on your plant, the new stems. The tips will usually die and turn black and, and that whole area will die. If you have a stem on your lilac tree that is mature, you'll, you'll notice that instead of the tips, you'll start having the problems right in the middle of the stem and that whole area in there will, will die. So what you want to do, once again, we do have resistant varieties that you can call the Master Gardeners and we can tell you a few of the varieties that you could pick. If you do have, uh, you know, the heirloom ones from your grandparents, then you'll need to do a few other things. Try to keep that plant as healthy as possible. Try to keep them in full sun because that's what the lilac trees like best. Uh, provide good air circulation when you do your pruning. Prune out anything that's dead. If those tips die, prune them out. Carefully wash your pruning equipment and cut, the, cut again on another area. In the spring, again, sorry you can't do that, but if you can protect them from the rain, try. Yeah, put a plastic hoop over your, your lilac. If it's a special one and you don't want it to get this disease, then definitely try it. Azalea, the rhododendron lace bug, this little insect. How many of you have rhododendrons? How many of you have the rhododendron lace bug? Okay, oh, some, some people are shaking their head no. Lucky you, that's really good. The lace bug came into our area about 2009, 2011, and it is devastating our rhododendrons and our azaleas. We have a rhododendron lace bug that looks just like the azalea lace bug, but the rhododendron lace bug doesn't do the damage that this little azalea lace bug does. She's very beautiful, and she is very, very tiny, an eighth of an inch, if even that. She has beautiful wings. That's why they call her the lace bug. What you'll notice is, as summer progresses, your leaves on your rhodes and your azaleas will start getting yellowish, and then they will start turning gray, and you'll wonder what the heck is happening to them. And if you turn over and look at the underneath side, you'll see all these black tar spots, these little black spots left from the insect. Well. Springtime is a perfect time to start figuring out what you're going to do to take care of this problem. Usually mid-April, I'm not sure when they'll do it this year, but usually mid-April, the eggs that the lace bug has laid last year, unfortunately, she lays those eggs inside of the leaf. So we can't do any winter spraying like a cover sprayer to, to smother those eggs because they're nice and safe inside the leaves. But those eggs will hatch out sometime around the middle of April, the end of April, and the nymphs will come out, the babies will come out. Well, the babies can't fly. They do suck a lot of the juices out of the plant, but they can't fly. So if you get in there with a nice, strong spray of water on the underneath side of your leaves, they don't sit on top, they sit underneath, and you spray them really hard with water, you're going to knock these babies off, and they don't have wings, they can't fly, they can't come back. If you wait until summer till they develop into an adult and you try to spray them off with a hard spray of water, they're just going to fly somewhere else until you're done and then they're going to come back again. Maintain really good plant health. Plants in the sun don't do as well as plants in the shade. Rhodes and azaleas do like a little bit of shade, so you probably have a little bit more trouble if your plants are in the sunshine. Also, if you plant the type of rhododendron that has that fuzzy underneath side of the leaves, most of those varieties, don't, the lace bugs don't seem to like them very much. So if you're having trouble with your rhodia and you know you've got to replace some, I would try some of those types that have the fuzz on the underneath side. Boxwood blight. How many of you have boxwood hedges? A few of you. Okay. This is a fairly new disease. In fact, in 2016, it really hit our area bad. And this disease starts from the bottom of your boxwood and moves up. Starts with spots on the leaves, then the spots get bigger, and then the leaves die, the leaves fall off. The bad thing about this is it's spread by water splashing. It's also spread by your pruner, your hedge trimmer. If you hedge trim a boxwood that has boxwood blight, 
you will transfer it to the one that doesn't. So it's, it's, it's a terrible, terrible problem that most of us are going to have if we keep having our boxwoods. But limit your pruning during the wet weather. Try to do it when it's a dry day and it's going to stay dry for several days. Remove any of the dead leaves down below. This fungus can stay alive on dead leaves for up to five years. Yeah, I know. So try to clean, get that sanitate, do that sanitation, clean out there. Disinfect your pruning equipment. Avoid overhead irrigation if possible. And um, space them, give them a little bit of more air circulation. Those of you that really like boxwood and if you have problem and you want a hedge that looks like a boxwood, the Japanese, um, excuse me, Japanese holly is a really good, it looks almost exactly like a boxwood, except the leaves are a little bit more cupped, a very pretty, pretty evergreen shrub that you can, that you can hedge trim just like you do boxwoods. Okay, I only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to talk to you about something else. Did you notice I didn't mention very many dis, uh, chemicals? I mentioned a lot of diseases, but I didn't tell you about any chemicals. That's because us as OSU master gardeners and those of you that are gardeners, we need to use what we call IPM. How many of you have heard of IPM? Okay, most of you, good. IPM means integrated pest management. And I'm just gonna read this for you, just for a second here. What IPM is, it is a strategy to prevent and suppress pests with the minimum impact on human health and the environment and on non-target organisms. Remember when I told you that if you spray a chemical to kill the bad guys, you're also killing the good guys? You're killing the non-target organisms too. It's a decision-making process that uses regular monitoring to decide if and when you need treatments. I have roses, yeah, they get black spots sometimes. I can, I can deal with that. I'm not, I'm not that picky about it. So I can decide, mm, I'll just let them go. I'll pull those leaves off. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, anyway, and when and if you need treatments are needed and to control the pests using the variety of tactics to keep the numbers low. So this is how you do it. This is the principles of it. First, you're going to go out there and you're going to monitor your plants. You're not going to know you have aphids on your roses unless you go out there and look at your roses are you? So monitor those plants all the time. Identify what the plant, the pest is. If you find an insect you think is bad, don't kill it right away. Figure out what it is. Bring it to the master gardeners. We love to figure out what these insects are. Establish what your acceptable level is. Like I said, I don't mind a little black spot. Maybe you don't like black spot at all, but I can take a little bit of it. Um, and then use all these strategies. Use cultural, physical, biological, and if you need to use some chemical, then take the easiest, the least disruptive, and the least toxic chemical that you can, that you can find and follow the directions. This is why IPM works. See this bug? This is a, this is a beetle. And do you see that damage on that leaf? Your first instinct is, oh my gosh, I gotta kill it. Look what he did. Well, if you'll notice that leaf real closely, you'll see it has brown edges where the chew marks are. That's old. He didn't sit there and chew that. And if I were to take that insect and bring it to the office like I did and identify it, oh, he's not a plant eater. He eats other bugs. So why am I going to kill him when he's out there eating all the other bugs that are in my garden? Um, here's a little trick for you that you might not know. It doesn't always work, but it works some of the time. If you see an insect, like this beetle, that has his head up, he's looking for food. He's looking for other bugs to eat. But if you see an insect whose head is the shape of his body and his head is down, he's looking at his lunch. He's going to eat that plant. Why should he look there when the plant is he's sitting on it? He's sitting on his lunch or his breakfast. So think about that when you're out there in, in your garden monitoring your plants. And I'm done, and thank you for coming. <laughs>